Hello, thank you. So my name's James Maybridge. I'm a retina surgeon and researcher at Moorfields and UCL. And I've been involved for some time in the development of new treatments, including stem cells for retinal conditions. So the big problem we have is that more than 200 million people have macular disease. This includes genetic diseases and age-related macular degeneration. And 30 million people are affected by sight impairment. So this is a major issue for individuals, their families and communities, and for society as a whole, given the impact on people's quality of life and their independence. So as many will know, the macula is part of the retina. So if the eyeball is like a camera, the lens is at the front, optically focus the images onto the retina, which is a sheet-like tissue of cells, specialised to sense light, much like the film in the camera. This layer converts the light to electrical nerve signals sent to the brain by the cable of the optic nerve. So diseases affecting the retina cause progressively irreversible impairment of sight. And especially vulnerable to disease in the retina is the highly sensitive central spot called the macula, which of course is the primary interest of the macular society. So one solution to these macular conditions is to find ways to protect against sight loss. And this, of course, is being explored in a range of approaches. But this depends on detailed understanding of the various causes in each instance. So an alternative solution is to repair the damage by transplanting healthy organs, tissue or cells to the retina. And this is something which could be useful regardless of the ultimate cause of each individual condition. So one option might be to transplant the whole eye, regardless of disease. And this, of course, would be an invaluable technique. We might ask why we cannot simply replace the eye by plumbing it in, plumbing in a whole healthy eyeball, just as one might a kidney, liver or heart. You might conceivably plumb an eye into the circulation, but the eye has complex circuitry of nerve cells, and it's not feasible to wire this in. It would require a precise connections to a million nerves in the cable of the optic nerve. So this is simply not feasible at the present time. Instead, it's considered more feasible to transplant specific components that are failing. In fact, <clears throat> certain optical components of the eye can be replaced effectively. For example, the cornea lens or the vitreous gel. But transplanting the retina, which is nerve cells, is a particular challenge. In fact, the retina is not a single layer but in fact is more than 10 layers with more than 60 distinct cell types. These include nerve cells for sensing light, nerve cells for processing it, and complex circuitry for transmission to the brain. Also include supporting structures for maintenance and to provide energy. So it's not a single nerve, a single nerve layer, but a complex structure. To achieve successful transplantation of the retina, one, has to, well, one will have to achieve several steps. Survival of the tissue, that is protection against harm from rejection in particular, integration of that tissue into the, into the um, host retina to form connections that are meaningful with neighboring cells, and the ability of the cells to function in a way that supports useful vision. So even replacement of just one of the many com components is very complex and ambitious. To simplify the challenge, there are three key questions that scientists are currently focused on. The first is to identify which of these components, which component of the retina, might most usefully be replaced. The second is to find the best way to source or develop the replacement component that can be implanted into the diseased eye. The third is to develop the techniques and technology to implant the component safely to the right place at the right time. And to address these challenges, researchers are taking advantage of exciting new opportunities for repair and regeneration, including new technologies for gene editing, generating stem cells, and producing complex tissues, so-called organoids, in the laboratory. So to take the first question, how does one identify which of the components of the retina might most usefully be replaced? Well, perhaps the most obvious is the light sensitive cells themselves. These are the receptor cells that sense light. 
An alternative might be the layer of pigmented cells that supports the function and survival of these photoreceptors. And a third option is the layer of vascular cells that provides nutrients and manages waste for all of these cells. We might consider transplanting all three layers, and this may ultimately be the most effective option because all three are affected by the condition and they are dependent on each other for function and survival. In fact, transplantation of all three layers has been tried in a small number of eyes, but it is currently ambitious and too risky. The side effects of the surgery outweigh any potential benefit. However, transplanting just one of these cell types individually could be a useful first step. This may be sufficient to help and could pave the way for combined transplants in the future. So one could transplant the photoreceptor cells independently. This would be dependent, their success would be dependent on connectivity, on connecting to the, the uh, downstream nerve fibers that relay to the brain. But success even with a modest number of cells might make a difference to some people. An alternative is to transplant the pigment cells. In isolation, the benefit of this may be limited to a small number of people, but arguably this is the most feasible approach. And there are some encouraging early results of this in people. And the third option is to transplant the vascular cells. At the moment, there's very limited experience of this, but I think we'll be seeing more in the future. The second big question is how to source the replacement component that might be implanted. The first consideration is whether to source this transplant, this transplant from the same individual or from a different donor. If it's from a different donor individual, it might be healthier and younger, but at risk of rejection because it's foreign tissue. If the cells are taken from the same individual, they may be at less risk of rejection. That would be an advantage. However, they will have weaknesses because they may be, have the same genetic makeup and that may be predisposing to the similar conditions. New techniques suggest that this genetic makeup may be addressed in the laboratory by gene editing before the tissue is transplanted. Another drawback of using cells from the same individual may be that they are affected by age. However, new technology, including stem cell technology, suggests that one might be able to develop younger cells from the same individual using technology in the laboratory. A second consideration when it comes to where to find cells for transplant is to decide how mature they should be. Should they be sourced from a mature cell or an immature cell? So in normal development, cells grow up, integrate and mature together for healthy tissue. In a diseased tissue, should we expect an immature or a mature cell to integrate best? This is one of the big unanswered questions. So mature cells have already been developed. They have already developed specialized form and function needed, but may not have the flexibility to integrate usefully into an environment that is unfamiliar and affected by disease. On the other hand, very young so-called stem cells are, are considered powerful because they have the potential to, to develop into any of a wide range of specialized cells. However, stem cells are evolved to do this during development and cannot necessarily be expected to do so naturally in a mature organ in the context of disease. In fact, precise control of the cell number and their behavior is essential for this to be effective and safe to protect against harm from unintended behavior and uncontrolled growth into tumors. So the promise of stem cells is hugely exciting and they can offer real benefit for diseases of the skin and the cornea and indeed the blood. But the benefit for most other conditions is unproven at present and it's commonly exaggerated especially for commercial benefit and often the risks of harm are ignored or overlooked in fact people have come to serious harm from unregulated use of stem cells for eye disease marketed by commercial clinics without evidence of benefit and this has been a huge cost financially to individuals to their site and their ability to benefit potentially from future treatments. So it's really critical to understand that stem cells are more likely to do serious harm than good unless they're very carefully controlled and handled. 
So the third big challenge is to consider which form the cells should be transplanted. They could be transplanted as suspensions in fluid, as a sheet, or in combined sheets. If they're in cell suspensions, this is something like scattering carpet tiles on a floor and hoping they organize themselves. They can be delivered by relatively simple injection, but the degree of organization is somewhat uncertain. If they're injected as a sheet of single cells, like laying a rug with or without a supporting underlay, this can provide a preformed layer of organized cells. One can be more confident about the organization, but it does require more invasive surgery to produce a sheet or to inject a sheet than it does to inject a suspension. And the surgical constraints may limit the area and indeed the area of sight that may benefit. Ultimately, combined multiple layers of different cells may be implanted, but this is even more ambitious. This kind of technology may be achieved using the three-dimensional organoids. This is sophisticated um, tissue culture that can now be grown in the laboratory. Another big question with respect to the form in which cells should be transplanted is the time point at which disease should be, uh, should be treated. When might transplantation be optimal? If transplants are delivered too late, the environment may be too degenerate to support it. However, if you inject them too early, the transplant may be unnecessary and the balance of risks may be unfavorable. So in clinical trials of stem cells to date, there are some early indications of benefit. And these understandably generate wide interest. But it's important to understand that the benefit is not yet proven with confidence and stem cells are not recognized as an, as an approved treatment for the retina at present. So in summary, there are many significant challenges to providing benefit. This is an ambitious, even an audacious aim. Approaches are focused on implanting specific cell types at various stages of maturity into eyes at various stages of disease progression. There is incremental progress and it's essential to, to appreciate the risks of harm. But the progress is accelerated by new technologies in stem cells, gene editing, and tissue modeling. And transplantation offers exciting prospects for protecting and improving sight in the future. Thank you. Do you think that cell therapies will be able to treat all forms of macular disease? So it's important to appreciate that the hope at the moment is that cell treatment, stem cells or cell transplantation um, is hoped to be able to improve the outcome for certain forms of macular disease. It's too early to know at the moment which forms those might be, and probably too ambitious to expect them to treat all forms of disease. Um, but I think from what I've said, you can understand that there are lots of challenges, but lots of hope too, that this kind of treatment may help certain forms of disease at certain stages. Could new eye cells be developed from a patient's own cells? Yes, absolutely. So the new technology means that one is able to actually to generate new eye cells from, in fact, different parts of somebody's uh, uh, body. So it's possible to take specimens from their skin or their blood and to change those in the laboratory with exciting new technology into stem cells and from there into cells of the retina. And the potential advantage of this is that it means that there's much less risk of rejection because they're coming from the same body. One of the disadvantages, as I outlined previously, is that these same cells, given that they are um, genetically similar, are also at risk of genetic disease. So it may be appropriate or necessary to correct for any genetic deficiencies before they're then retransplanted back into the body. But certainly this offers um, more exciting um, areas of um, uh, technology that potentially can improve the outcomes. What would you advise if people see adverts for clinics offering stem cell treatments? So it, it's very important to be aware that stem cells um, are powerful and potentially can cause harm unless they're very carefully controlled. And so it's very important not to, to get involved in new treatments of stem cells unless they are part of approved treatments or approved trials. Um, 
as I mentioned, many people have come to harm through the use of stem cells, even from their own bodies, because they are unproven and unregulated. And those risks of harm have been um, very poorly um, explored and not communicated. There is scope for people to be misled into thinking that their, uh, their sight can be improved dramatically through stem cells because of the misconception of the power of stem cells doing good. Uh, but I would advise that anybody considering taking part in trials or indeed offering um, or clinics offering treatment um, checks out that out very carefully. In fact, it's important to understand that one shouldn't ever be asked for um, money, one shouldn't ever be asked to pay for these treatments because um, they are only currently available in approved centers as part of trials.